So those are, the, those are the seven big risk factors that account for at least 50% of the Alzheimer's risk. In other words, if you could reduce these risk factor burdens by about 10%, you could cut the cases of Alzheimer's worldwide by over a million individuals. Uh, so gray matter houses the neurons, white matter connects them. And what I found is that as people went into the obese range of a BMI of 30 or higher, uh, there were uh, significant reductions in, in brain volumes in areas of the brain important for cognition, such as the frontal lobes and hippocampus. I predict that brain health will become a trillion dollar a year industry. Brian Muncy is probably the smartest guy I know. Trust me, Muncy is the nutrition guy. Ryan Muncy's out there trying to make the world better for all of us. The Optimal Performance Podcast is bold, edgy, creative, entertaining, and epic. Ryan Muncy is my go-to guy. Ryan Muncy is he's the first guy I call. He's making people's lives better. Ryan Muncy is an innovator. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Optimal Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Muncy, and I want to thank you for being here today, sharing your time with us. Uh, I've got a really, really cool episode coming up for you with Dr. Cyrus Raji. Uh, I'll get to the intro in just a minute. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, number one, please go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Uh, when we read your review on the air, we will hook you up with free natural stacks products. So this one is from bread van medicine, man, genuinely awesome podcast. I am a naturopathic medical student and obviously a huge proponent of helping the body achieve and perform in ways that it is designed to do. Many podcasts are in a similar tribe as I am, yet they seem to solicit or promote something. Through my search, I found this podcast. Now, I have gone from following 10 to 15 podcasts to simply listening to this one. Every podcast has an awesome guest with new information or different perspectives on subjects other than weight loss or performance in the gym. This info helps not only me, but everyone around me and my patients in the future. Episodes 100 slash 101 and 121 absolutely hit the nail on the head for me. Can't wait to get through the entire list of podcasts and future episodes. Keep up the awesome work, Ryan. Your info reaches farther than you think. Breadman Medicine Man, thank you so much. That's amazing. Um, really happy to be a part of your journey. Thank you for being here with us. Shoot me an email, ryan at naturalstacks.com, and we will hook you up with a care package. For you guys listening, please share this episode of the OPP with the people in your life that you know will benefit from the things that we talk about on this show. Um, Dr. Raji is an incredibly smart man. He is doing some great research uh, looking into quanti quantitative neuroimaging. Um, I first encountered Dr. Raji in, uh, he, he spoke recently at the Silicon Valley Health Institute. Um, and like I said, he, his focus is on quantitative neuroimaging, uh, sp specifically volumetrics, measurement of brain volumes from magnetic resonance images or MRI. He's been researching for over 10 years. Um, brain volumes uh, can actually change in relation to our lifestyle choices from obesity to physical activity to dietary choices. Uh, his work has a tremendous impact on the prevention of cognitive decline and the preservation of brain health. He was recently awarded the 2017 grant for Alzheimer's. Uh, he's doing a lot of uh, research with the reduction of brain volumes um, and uh, how that is tied into various neuropsychiatric disorders like Alzheimer's, uh, depression, tra traumatic brain injury. This is a really, really cool podcast. And I'm not just saying that because it's our show. Uh, I had to pinch myself several times. My head was spinning uh, during this recording uh, at, at some of the stuff that we got to, to talk about. So uh, Dr. Raji, if you're listening to this, thank you for being a part of the OPP. Uh, for you guys listening, enjoy this one. And thanks for being here. Well, uh, let's kick it off by congratulating you. You had some big news uh, recently. I guess it was about to going on three months ago, uh, but you were awarded the 2017 Alzheimer's grant. 
Yeah, so I, I was awarded the Berger Fund grant from the American Society of Neuroradiology. That's that's correct. Uh, pretty happy and grateful for that. It's a great uh, honor and uh, good for the research. Yeah. So, so what was it that you think um, you know got you that award? What do you have planned with uh, the grant money? Yeah. So the whole purpose behind the grant is to look at the brain's intrinsic connections, called the connectome the wiring maps of the brain that we can now describe with imaging and to see how that can change in specifically Alzheimer's disease. Okay, great. And, and I mean, this is sort of what you've been doing for the last decade or more, right? Yes. If you look at my work going back uh, now to around 2006, 2007 is when I started in this, I have been trying to use quantitative brain imaging to better predict risk for Alzheimer's disease and to look at factors that can modify that risk, such as lifestyle. Okay. So well, let's hit you with the, the million dollar question right off the bat. What have you learned? I've learned that a lot of what we call Alzheimer's disease isn't actually strictly speaking Alzheimer's disease itself. And even when it is, it's driven by a lot of modifiable risk factors that can account for up to half the risk that we can actually describe and define on quantitative imaging. Okay, so there's a lot for us to dig into there. Um, let's take that kind of bit by bit. And you said a lot of what we may be considering Alzheimer's is not Alzheimer's. What do you mean by that? Or, or give us some examples. Well, for instance, you know, the whole idea of Alzheimer's disease comes from the concept that there are these pathologic proteins called plaques and tangles that kill neurons and in doing so lead to the memory decline that we see in Alzheimer's. However, even though there have been multiple drug trials targeting one of these proteins called amyloid, none of those trials have actually worked. And a lot of what we look at with what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is sort of the pre-Alzheimer's stage of senior moments that then can become something much worse, can be driven by factors like bad blood vessels, vascular disease, lack of physical activity. And, and so a lot of these individuals get labeled with Alzheimer's disease because we hear it so much that that's the diagnosis that many people presume, but it's not necessarily what's actually happening to these individuals. And there are many different ways that one can become cognitively declined that don't involve Alzheimer's disease itself. And so I think that's the main point behind what I said earlier in terms of a lot of what we call Alzheimer's disease doesn't strictly speaking become Alzheimer's disease itself or isn't actually Alzheimer's. I think that's an important thing to, you know, highlight and, and you know, keep on top of people's minds that not all cognitive decline is Alzheimer's. What would, um, I guess from a clinical setting, how can we uh, move to a scenario where, you know, that um, diagnosis is more accurate? Is that the right way to phrase that? Correct. I think that when somebody presents with memory loss, you can't automatically jump to the Alzheimer's diagnosis. You have to hunt for other potential causes. And there are many different ways to do this. One way is to run lab tests to make sure that they're not low in certain vitamins like vitamin B12 a deficiency of which can cause Alzheimer's-like symptoms, but it's totally preventable. Uh, looking at factors in their environment that can lead to memory loss. I mentioned vascular disease, but another one is head trauma. Head trauma is a very important driving force of cognitive decline that's often unrecognized or not diagnosed. And sometimes it's because people don't ask patients or when they ask the patients, the patients might not remember that they've had a head trauma, for example. Uh, but that's very important to assess. Um, and there are other factors too, but those are just a couple that are very common uh, that could be driving the cognitive decline. Yeah, I mean, the, the head trauma one is a very interesting thing. Uh, I've been following you on Twitter since we uh, started setting this anyway, up. And the tweet was, you know, that CTE had been discovered uh, or, or neuropathologically diagnosed in 110 out of 111 deceased NFL players who participated in the brain donation program. That's incredibly alarming, is it not? 
Correct. And a lot of that work was actually started by one of my research collaborators, Bennett Amalu, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. You know, he was uh, portrayed by Will Smith in the movie Concussion, right, right. Uh, which, um, which is kind of interesting because I was training as an MD-PhD student at Pittsburgh around the time he made his discovery. So a lot, mm. of, the, a lot of the people in the movie that he worked with were my own mentors. Uh, wow. So, you know, Steve Dukoski was the chairman of neurology at the time. I worked with him very closely, uh, you know, in our, our consensus conference every week, uh, looking at different causes of cognitive decline. Um, you know, uh, Ron Hamilton, who is portrayed by Stephen Moyer from True Blood, uh, was also one of my uh, teachers and collaborators as well. Uh, and, and so I remember around that time what the environment was like, but I didn't actually start working with Bennett until after that, because I think at the time he was keeping a very low profile because he was really concerned about all of the pushback from the NFL on that research. And to go from that initial pushback to now the reality of how common CTE is definitely highlights the, the other factors of cognitive decline. And CTE does not affect the same parts of the brain as Alzheimer's. So it's not like Alzheimer's in football players. It's a distinct uh, neuropathological entity. You know, I saw Pittsburgh on your bio and, and it just, it didn't even dawn on me that you may have connections to that. I, I'm fascinated, just a, a, maybe a short tangent into the, the human interest piece, you know, that, that exists there. I mean, you mentioned the environment. It, it had to have been incredibly uh, tenuous and stressful for, for everyone involved with that, you know, to fight, uh, to, to continue to get that research and the truth out there, was it not? Oh, no, no, no. Quite the opposite. In fact, at the time, it was probably the, the least uh, focused thing that we were doing. The biggest focus at the time was developing this new type of imaging called Pittsburgh Compound B, which was a tracer that could bind to the pathologic proteins of Alzheimer's disease and that could be imaged on a PET scanner. So PET stands for positron emission tomography and involves the injection of a radioactive tracer that can then travel to the brain and bind to specific proteins of interest. And so my first mentor in research, Bill Klunk, actually invented that tracer. And I was the first graduate student that he had in the lab. This was around 2004. And it was almost a Haiti experience because what we thought we were going to do with that tracer was to image the cure, was to image the, um, the actual reversal of Alzheimer's disease with what the pharmaceutical companies were developing with targeted anti-amyloid drugs. Mm -hmm. But there were a couple of things that happened. One, when the drugs were administered, yes, they did remove the amyloid from the brain, but in place of where the amyloid was were just empty parts of the brain where live neurons used to be. In other words, by the time you saw that amyloid in the brain, the neurons were already dead. And so removing the amyloid once the neurons were already dead didn't actually help the patient recover because the neurons didn't come back once the amyloid was taken away. Gotcha. So, so we had a lot of optimism at the time and the head trauma thing was a very, very peripheral focus compared to everything else we were doing at the time. But then once the amyloid drugs didn't work, and then we got more focused on lifestyle factors and other potential causes of cognitive decline, then the head trauma story became more prominent in recent years. And only then were individuals, you know, starting to pay attention to it on a larger scale. Gotcha. So uh, let's go back. You said what you guys were seeing with the imaging, um, you know, that the drugs weren't successful necessarily in, in treating because once we saw the amyloids or once you saw the amyloids, the neurons were gone. Is there something that you have discovered? Is there something that we can do from a treatment standpoint to replace or, or bring back, regenerate neurons? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just speaking with the collaborator earlier this morning about the concept of bio and tissue engineering and creating scaffolds on which growth factors can promote. So growth factors are these kind of substances released in the brain that can actually help uh, neurons sprout 
micro new, uh, you know, dendritic connections and mm -hmm. increased neuronal metabolism. And it's, it's kind of like miracle growth for the brain. And so one example of that is BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic growth factor. And so as soon as you said miracle grow, that's what popped into my head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Those old commercials and stuff like that. But, but, you know, um, I was talking with this collaborator, uh, you know, at UCLA and, and, and I asked her, you know, can we create scaffolds of tissue? And it's something that they're really working on actively right now. So I think um, the answer is in clinical practice right now, no, but it is a, a very active area of research. We do know that you can release growth factors in the brain through exercise. Right. So that is something that everybody can start doing right now. And so if you're engaged in physical activity, what I've found in my research is that it actually correlates to larger amounts of uh, neuronal mass and gray matter volume where the neurons are housed. And that's something that can be induced through even light exercise. Yeah, it's funny. That's, uh, it's actually one of the bullet points I have written down to, to ask you about. And specifically, um, I, there, there's a whole topic that we can get into with brain volume. And I do want to cover that. But since you mentioned exercise, you know, one of the specific questions I had for you and, and for you guys listening, um, it's been a while, but we, we posted a blog post probably a year, year and a half ago on BDNF. Uh, a lot of research uh, that went into that post. I will link to that in the show notes for this if you guys want to go jump off and, and follow that rabbit hole. But uh, Cyrus, are there uh, specific forms or particular types of exercise that you have found to have the biggest impact on BDNF? Well, I haven't specifically correlated BDNF uh, per se, but I have kind of correlated exercise with what the end outcome of BDNF should be, which is larger hippocampal volumes. So the hippocampus is the main memory structure in the brain. Uh, in mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease, it shrinks. And so when the hippocampus shrinks, neurons are dying, and that means that memory function is impaired. So you lose memory. But what I've discovered in my research is that if you exercise and you're physically active, that results in larger volumes in the hippocampus. And one of my colleagues at Pittsburgh actually did a separate randomized clinical trial showing this. And what he was doing was simple aerobic exercise. Uh, so it wasn't the case that people were necessarily doing very aggressive cardiovascular workouts. Even simple walking, uh, I found, can be correlated to larger hippocampal volumes. And I did a separate study which looked at leisure activities. So I asked the question, if somebody participated in just the leisure activities they liked from, you know, calisthenics to riding an exercise cycle to even gardening or ballroom dancing, mm -hmm. if you can burn a larger number of calories from those leisure activities, you can also generate a similar effect in the brain of larger gray matter volumes in the hippocampus. So that's important because it suggests that you don't have to prescribe a one size fits all exercise regimen. If you simply do the exercises that you enjoy, Number one, you're more likely to keep doing them. And then number two, that can still create, you know, similar effects to somebody else's distinct exercise preferences. That's beautiful to know. Um, I know our audience is one that, you know, we're, we're always looking for, okay, great. We know this. Uh, we know activity is great for us. You know, what's the best way to do it? Should we strength train? Should we do high intensity intervals? Should it be low intensity? So you, what you just told us was, and, and for you guys listening, you know, it really doesn't matter. Just move, right? Correct. And I actually published that uh, data in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease back in 2016. So is that um, the one that was picked up by like New York Times where they were talking about like yoga and uh, uh, that was a different paper, but the New York Times did cover um, the work that I published under the title Sweat Smart. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, that was, uh, that was profiled by them. Okay. I'll grab a link to that and uh, we'll put that in the show notes for uh, our listeners as well. Awesome. Um, okay. So uh, let's stay on this brain volume um, topic for a few minutes. You've published some, some other stuff and, and talked about this in some of your speaking engagements. What else has an impact on increasing or decreasing brain volume? Well, obesity can unfortunately be correlated to reduced brain volume. And so that was actually the first work I ever published uh, in this area was looking at body mass index and correlating it in a group of 78 year olds on average with, with brain volumes, both gray matter and white matter. 
Uh, so gray matter houses the neurons, white matter connects them. And what I found is that as, as people went into the obese range of a BMI of 30 or higher, uh, there were uh, significant reductions in, in brain volumes in areas of the brain important for cognition, such as the frontal lobes and hippocampus. Um, and about several years after that paper was published, there was a lot of epidemiologic literature being published showing that obesity itself is a separate driver of, of Alzheimer's disease risk. That's fascinating. And I'm sure that, that that ties into what you were mentioning in the very beginning about you know, lifestyle choices and, and how those can impact Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. But, but here's the thing that was really fascinating about that work. When I accounted for obesity, it wiped out the abnormal effects on brain volume from diabetes, for instance, or other vascular diseases. In other words, obesity seems to be the big risk factor that controlled them all in terms of the effects on the brain. And that makes sense because when you have a lot of extra adipose tissue, you know, you imagine somebody who's obese, they're kind of imprisoned in this wall of adipose tissue. It's releasing inflammatory cytokines and substances into the body that can separately cause bad effects on blood flow and neuronal metabolism. So when you have that huge pro-inflammatory organ from all of this adipose tissue and fat, that can cause a lot of long-term effects and in chronic inflammation in the brain. And there's a lot of literature now suggesting that one of the ways Alzheimer's progresses is through this chronic inflammatory response in the brain. That's fascinating. So just, I just want to highlight this. You said once that BMI was over 30, that's when you started to see the reduction in brain volume and cognitive decline. At least the most severe ones. There was reduced okay. brain volume for overweight BMI, but the effects were not as strong as with the obesity range. Okay. So, you know, and also we're looking at 78 year olds. So most of the high BMI is going to be secondary to extra fat. Whereas, you know, if you have somebody who's an athlete, who's, you know, weightlifting and is a bodybuilder, they're going to have a BMI of above 25, but that's mostly due to muscle. Right. So, that's not, that's not inflammatory uh, producing tissue. Not in that setting. No. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so we've got obesity can decrease brain volume. Um, activity or exercise will not only help with obesity, but it can increase hippocampal size. Um, what else can change or impact brain volume? Turns out that there's a growing literature on the influence of diet. Uh, on the brain. So th there's this beautiful paper published by one of my uh, colleagues at UCLA, Fernando Gomez Pinilla, where he describes how over the course of history, you know, as humans evolved, their skulls got bigger. And the reason their skulls got bigger is because their brains got bigger. So when you look at the underlying development of societies and the growth of skulls and the evolution of humans into Homo sapiens, a lot of those increased skull sizes and evolution happened when humans started settling near big rivers. And this happened worldwide, right? I mean, you have, you know, you know, you have the Nile in Egypt, you have the Ganges in India, you have the Yangtze in China. And what do all of these rivers have in common? What is teeming in these rivers? Uh, mm -hmm. Fish, right? right? And what do fish have that, are, are, that we found to be really useful for brain metabolism? <laughs> Yeah. Omega-3 fatty acids, right? So your brain is mostly fat, right? Fat surrounds the myelin sheaths of neurons. Fat makes up the membranes of neurons as well. Uh, and then, of course, the myelin that is around white matter. Uh, so, you know, the omega-3 fatty acids from fish can actually incorporate into cell membranes and myelin sheaths and promote brain health that way. So I studied the influence of fish consumption on brain volumes. And what I found was independent of obesity and independent of physical activity, consuming fish at least once a week that was either baked or broiled was correlated to larger brain volumes in the hippocampus, posterior cortical regions involved in cognition, and of course the frontal lobes. Just eating once or twice, eating fish once or twice a week is enough. At least once a week, yeah. So it, it, it wasn't like, you so said there was not a bigger effect of eating fish four times a week. Okay, example. right, right. So there uh, is a kind of a point of diminishing return on that. Yeah, uh, which is nice because not everybody likes to eat um, fish. And, 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 you know, I didn't study in that particular investigation if other sources of omega-3 
can can have the uh, similar effect. So we didn't look at supplements. Uh, we didn't look at other sources. We just looked at the fish consumption. Right. So as you're bringing that up, I mean, I'm I'm thinking about how our diet has changed. Um, you know, over the last hundred years, two hundred years. Um, that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio has changed significantly. Um, you know, it's gone from like a one-to-one, somewhere one-to-one or one-to-three ratio to like one-to-20. Um, is that, and we talk about how that can increase inflammation, is, is that tied in in any way? Is it, you know, is it, is it the reduction in omega-3 intake or is it the out of balance of that ratio that's contributing to more inflammation and a, a higher disease state? Well, I think that if you're eating more, you know, pro-inflammatory foods, uh, you know, like processed foods, carbohydrates, then you're not going to be eating as much of the good stuff. Uh, so it's that reduced intake combined with the increased intake of, you know, kind of very unhelpful foods that I think is probably leading to that imbalance. Um, but it's not to say that eating fish is always a good thing. So for example, uh, you know, if somebody eats a lot of mackerel fish or swordfish and gets exposed to the high amounts of mercury, uh, that's not going to be good for neurons either. It's going right. to be neurotoxic as well. And that's actually another potential cause of cognitive decline is heavy metals. You know, if somebody has very high mercury levels, they're going to have a lot of the symptoms similar to Alzheimer's disease. But if they don't get tested for the mercury levels, nobody's going to know that. So again, you know, I think uh, not jumping to the Alzheimer's diagnosis right away is, is very important. And you know, at UCLA, we actually measure hippocampal volumes using a program called NeuroReader. NeuroReader is an FDA-cleared algorithm that does this. And even when we show that the hippocampus is abnormally low, we're not going to jump to the Alzheimer's diagnosis on that one time point because to prove somebody has Alzheimer's disease, you have to show that the hippocampus is shrinking over time, at least over the course of a year, if not longer. Hmm. So ultimately, you know, identifying the other causes and then putting people on preventative lifestyle approaches, I think is very, very important. And so I think reducing intake of processed foods is one element of that to reduce the inflammation. And then taking in really healthy foods, you know, like organic omega threes and salmon and stuff like that, I think is going to be a very important prescription for reducing cognitive decline in the future. Okay, so I guess would it be safe to sort of characterize your approach to diet as um, following an anti-inflammatory, uh, you know, template and maybe eating organic as much as possible to avoid chemicals, pesticides, hormone disruptors? Yeah, but I mean, organic itself has become a catch-all term, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it has. Or, 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 organic has been applied to a lot of things that aren't necessarily truly organic. Uh, right. And, you know, you know, there's limits to how much you can push, uh, you know, organic. You know, you, you still want to pasteurize your milk, for example. You don't want it to be that organic, right? Uh, so ultimately I think, uh, you know, there's a limit to how far you can take this, but I think, you know, reducing the intake of processed foods, I think is a very important step right off the bat. Uh, and I think that that's one thing that will not only decrease risk for Alzheimer's disease, but I would argue would also optimize cognition for younger individuals in our age group. Right. You know, I'm, I'm 36. And I think that following brain healthy lifestyles right now is only going to be helpful for optimizing cognition and performance right now. Oh, and we totally agree. I mean, that's that's what this show is all about, and that's what our listeners are into. So you're you're, you're right. preaching to the choir on that one, right? So by by following these sorts of lifestyle factors for preventing Alzheimer's disease in your 30s, you're really also following a simultaneous cognitive optimization program. Yeah, yeah. Um, so some of the other uh, imaging that you have participated in is looking at. Um, uh, the difference between dementia and depression. Uh, I think that's fascinating. What, is, what does that look like? What's the difference when you look at imaging for those? Yeah, so there are different ways of imaging the human brain. I've commonly looked at brain structure, but we can also look at brain function. So looking at blood flow to the brain as reduced blood flow can often change before the actual structure of the brain changes. Okay. Uh, I emphasize brain structure, not because I think it's the most important way to image the brain. It's not. It's not because I think it's the only way to image the brain. It's not. 
I promote that because for patient access, it's far easier to get structural imaging of the brain. So when you look at all of the MRI machines across this country and all the millions of scans done per year and the clinical practice guidelines, structural MRI of the brain is by far the easiest to get. And so that's one of the reasons why I like the idea of looking at quantitative imaging of the brain with, you know, neuroreader algorithm and trying to characterize that. But we can also look at blood flow in the brain. And so blood flow in the brain can be interrogated many different ways. In the study you mentioned specifically, we looked at how differences in blood flow to the brain can vary across depression versus dementia. And that's important because in the elderly population, depression can often be mistaken for Alzheimer's disease and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But they have very different treatments, right? So for, right. for dementia, you put them on an antidepressant. For Alzheimer's disease, you put them on Aricept or some cholinesterase inhibitor or uh, you know, a Nemendo that looks at M NMDA channels and stuff like that. But uh, I think that, you know, getting the diagnosis right becomes very important. And imaging can identify different signatures of these diseases. So, for instance, in Alzheimer's disease, the back part of the brain, the parietal lobes, the medial temporal lobes are, are abnormally low in their blood flow. In depression, the front part of the brain is more affected than in Alzheimer's disease. And so by looking at these characteristics, you can distinguish them from each other uh, with good sensitivity and specificity. Um, so I think that that was what that paper targeted. And I think it's important to identify which is which, because again, they have very different treatments. Yeah, absolutely. So, so my next question is then, what does that tell us about the pathology of those, I guess, dysfunctions? Well, the pathology we hear about with depression, and, and I think it's far more complicated than it's often described, but what's most commonly described in the public domain is, is difficulties with neurotransmitter and serotonin release in the brain. And with Alzheimer's disease, it's the actual death of neurons by you know, amyloid, tau, inflammatory factors, some combination of each. And so Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disease neurons are actively dying in Alzheimer's disease. In depression, neurons aren't working as well as they should be working, but they're not necessarily dying or progressing that we see in Alzheimer's disease. And so I think they're very different pathologies, but they can overlap. Depression itself can be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. We don't really have a good understanding of why that's the case. For example, if someone is depressed, they might not be physically active because they don't want to get out of bed. But we also know lack of physical activity itself can increase the risk for Alzheimer's, right? So a lot of these pathologies and risk factors are independent, but they overlap. And I think that that's one important thing to understand with depression with respect to dementia. But it's still important to try to distinguish the two so that we can put patients on the right treatment. And I think that's where imaging and precision neuroimaging approaches will become very important in the future. Yeah. So you mentioned with depression, it's, it's not neurons dying as much as it is potentially issues with neurotransmitters. Are there uh, some, um, I don't, I guess we'll, we'll use the word hacks. Are, are there some, some tools that we can put in our toolbox to, um, you know, stave off depression or, you know, optimize neurotransmitter function? I think the healthy lifestyle and diet approaches are very helpful right off the bat. Okay. Um, so physical activity is going to promote serotonin release. Uh, some individuals suffer from seasonal affective disorder, which is kind of, lack of adequate sunlight. And you know, when, when sunlight goes into your eyes, it triggers serotonin release. So if you're not getting as much sun uh, or light, that can certainly increase the risk for depression in certain individuals who are susceptible to seasonal affective disorder. Uh, I think that um, the diet becomes very important, right? So yeah. you know, if, if you eat more sugar and processed sugar, that's actually been correlated to increased risk of depression in men, which I find very interesting. Uh, so I think that leading a healthy lifestyle is important, but I don't think it's just that. I think that we talk about physical hacks for this sort of thing, but there are also mental hacks as well. I think that, you know, for instance, rumination, people who ruminate 
right? They're always dwelling on the same thing or reliving the same moment that's really bothering them. Mm -hmm. That can also increase the risk for depression as well. So, you know, I think that uh, you need a mental gym as well as a physical gym in order to address these sorts of things. I like that. I like that. Uh, um, let me just add something. One thing that I personally find helpful for myself on the mental side is transcendental meditation, TM. Okay. You, uh, we've heard about that on the show before. What specifically do you like about that? You know, I learned TM in LA. It was a very LA thing where, you know, I went to this place in Beverly Hills and I learned a mantra and the mantra is actually customized for the individual. So it's not like some catch all mantra that somebody tells you to do. It's, it's something that's very tailored to the individual person. And the idea of the mantra is at least for me, a way of resetting the brain. It's kind of like some white noise that you put in the brain that can kind of not necessarily drown out all the negative thoughts you might have, but lessen their impact. So when you're reciting the mantra to yourself, you're still going to have negative thoughts that pop in your brain, but they don't stay there. They just kind of flitter in and flitter out. And I find that remarkably helpful in terms of the kind of mental retuning. And I learned TM not because I think it's the most important style of meditation, probably not, isn't necessarily the most important style uh, or the only way to do it. I just learned it because I've seen the most scientific literature published on it, although there's a lot more being published on mindfulness as well. Uh, and it's also been around the longest in this country. Uh, so that's the reason why I learned it for myself. And so a form of meditation, whether it's TM or mindfulness or, or kind of, you know, some people like chakras and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, people can try that and see what, what may work the best for them. But I think you do need some form of mental retuning. I don't think going to the gym by itself uh, or exercising itself, while very helpful and should be done, is the only way to do it. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, and, and that sort of reminds me of something that uh, a few weeks ago I was in uh, Napa Valley to visit um, Todd White and, and his team at Dry Farm Wines for a podcast that we did. And if you guys haven't listened to that one, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But you know, that particular episode, we didn't even talk about wine. We talked all about the peace and the profit manifesto, the gratitude and abundance practices that that, that team has worked into their daily um, business uh, or, or operations. And one of the things that I took away from from talking with Todd was, I guess you could call it a mantra or or something that I'm repeating in my head, but it is uh, appreciation not expectation. And ever since then, I have used that sort of in the back of my head uh, for a lot of different situations. And it has been a powerful shift for me. So uh, I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about, Cyrus, with a, a, a mantra for TM. But well, the, the mantra, the mantra is not really uh, the mantra is kind of like almost just a, a made up word. So it's not like I'm telling myself I'm grateful for this and that. It's just kind of this made up war that kind of allows me to reset my brain. And actually, I do understand what you're talking about with the gratitude practices. So for example, if I'm in a stressful situation, I don't think to myself, oh my goodness, I'm in this stressful situation. Why am I so stressed, et cetera, et cetera. I think to myself, okay, I'm in this situation. I got a problem and I actually get to try to solve this problem which is really cool. So I'm gonna focus on solving the problem. And when I do that, I kind of take it out of myself and just focus it on the task at hand. And I find that that's very helpful for dealing with acute stress. Yeah, I like that. You said something a few minutes ago when we were talking about neurotransmitters with um, you know, being exposed to sunlight and how that can change our neurotransmitter profile. I'm just curious, have you ever seen imaging of brains that have been uh, like comparing brains that have, have a lot of sun exposure and some that are, are not being, you know, out in the sun? There have been research studies published on it. Uh, and there are actually ways of looking at serotonin receptor distribution in the brain. So you can actually look at, you know, the levels of what's called the serotonin receptor transporter. Uh, in the brain on PET scans. So the same modality I talked about earlier for imaging amyloid can be used to image serotonin receptor transporters. Uh, 
And there was this one study published back in 2014 where they found that individuals with seasonal affective disorders had you know, higher levels of serotonin receptor transporter in the winter months, uh, but the healthy volunteers in the study didn't have that. So it is possible to see the differences in the serotonin receptor metabolism uh, in those individuals. And, and I think that you know, this is all going back to the importance of quantitative imaging. We don't do that routinely in brain imaging. So when you get brain imaging done, typically what happens is, you know, you have somebody assess the images visually for big problems, big stroke, big mass, smaller lesions, but actually quantifying the functional levels in the brain, looking at the brain's wiring and connectomes, I think that's going to be the future of what I do, which is neuroradiology. And that's actually one of the reasons why the American Society of Neuroradiology funds the type of research that I do, because that's what we're trying to do in clinical practice. And so in 10 years, when you go in to get a scan done, you'll have very advanced computational readouts that look at different factors of structure and function in the brain. We'll have powerful machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to help us make the best sense of this data. And then you can really have a better understanding of what's happening in your brain, not just with a lot of precision, but with a lot of personalized precision to your own body and your own brain. That's pretty fascinating. Now, and just for our listeners, when you're saying quantitative, uh, instead of just looking at like one scan and looking for big things, that quantitative just means you're looking at a database and kind of comparing to the norm, correct? Right. So that's how NeuroReader works. So NeuroReader, uh, which is a software that we, we work with. Um, and the reason I mentioned NeuroReader is because it's FDA cleared. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of quantitative imaging stuff out there that you'll read about in research papers. And it's really great science, very well thought out, fantastically used. None of it can be applied to patients because it hasn't passed regulatory muster with FDA clearance. And so I think that's the main issue. And so NeuroReader, you know, it's funny. NeuroReader measures the actual physical volume of the brain. But the actual science behind NeuroReader has been around for over 20 years. Scientists were publishing about brain structure and volume measurements back in the mid 90s. But the FDA clearance for these algorithms for clinical practice didn't happen until 20, early 2010s or 2015 in the case of NeuroReader. So ultimately, it takes a long time for these things to reach clinical practice. I think now the lag time is getting shorter because there's a lot more collaboration. There's a lot more big data initiatives that are making this easier to get out there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's what happens with NeuroReader. So let's say I measured your brain with NeuroReader, and we looked at the size of your hippocampus, and we compared it to a normative database. We could then get an actual measurement. We can look at the actual percentile of the measurement. And so we could look at you know, your brain and say, okay, you're in the 99th percentile, which is very, very high. And so that's great because it shows that your hippocampus is, is you know, really within normal limit. But even if your hippocampus was 50th percentile, that's not necessarily abnormal. We don't call anything abnormal unless it's below the 25th percentile. Uh, and I think that you know, that's based on the amount of atrophy you need to have to actually worry about actual clinical symptoms. We don't want to call people with no symptoms as having necessarily abnormal hippocampal volumes. But if you track volumes over time, that change over time is more important than any one time point. And so the trend becomes very key as well. And we've imaged individuals who've actually increased their hippocampal volumes with the NeuroReader program based on their own lifestyle metrics and, and adjustments. And that involves physical activity like we talked about, dietary adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Some people like to take supplements, although we haven't studied any one supplement that necessarily accounts for this effect. And so I think that the ability to track these measurement changes is going to be very important for the future in terms of preventing cognitive decline. And just like, just like individuals worry about their cholesterol, individuals should also worry about their hippocampal volumes, especially, right. as, especially as they get older. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you mentioned earlier with Alzheimer's and seeing these amyloid plaques, and that by the time they show up, it's too late. Are there warning signs that you are looking for um, before amyloid would show up? Well, I think in looking at cognitive decline overall, 
just not necessarily due to Alzheimer's disease, but all causes of cognitive decline, you have to look at individuals and their lifestyle. And so there was a paper published by uh, one of my mentors at UCSF, Kristen Yaffe. This was published back in 2011, but it's been cited by other scientists over a thousand times. And it looked at the actual epidemiology of this risk and looking at, you know, which lifestyle factors account for Alzheimer's risk. And so they looked at all the different literature and they collated all the different risk factors and they did it both in the US as well as worldwide. And so there are about seven risk factors that account for at least half of all Alzheimer's risk. Uh, it's diabetes, uh, high blood pressure at midlife, so not when you're older, but when you're even middle-aged, middle-aged obesity, depression, lack of physical activity, smoking, and low educational status. So those are the, those are the seven big risk factors that account for at least 50% of the Alzheimer's risk. In other words, if you could reduce these risk factor burdens by about 10%, you could cut the cases of Alzheimer's worldwide by over a million individuals. Uh, now, what do you think the biggest risk factor is in, in, in worldwide? Uh, Just if you, if you, if you I, had to guess. If you had to yeah, guess. I, I'm, I, of those, I, I would say education. Correct. That's exactly right. Worldwide, low education is far and away the biggest risk factor that's preventable for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, now, because what, I mean, just kind of deducing that, I mean, worldwide outside of the US, I don't think as many people smoke. I don't think as many of them are as sedentary. Um, you know, we probably have the best access to food security. Well, it's, it's not all great food, but um, yeah. Okay. You're, abso you're absolutely right. Now, what do you think it is in the United States? Either obesity or decreased physical activity. That, you're exactly right. And in fact, it's physical inactivity, but it's, it's connected with obesity. So then they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Okay. So looking at somebody's risk factor profile, if you have an individual with even just a couple of these risk factors, then those are warning signs right off the bat that they're at risk of cognitive decline in the future. And if somebody has all seven of these risk factors, well, then they're definitely at a very severe risk of cognitive decline in the future. Right. So I think you have to start there. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly, I mean, that, that for, for you guys listening, I mean, it's diabetes, blood pressure, obesity, obesity, depression, education, smoking, decreased physical activity. Um, I'll put those on the show notes. We'll highlight that. We'll pull that out. We'll make sure that everybody listening, you know, knows. And, I, that, and, and I'll email you that paper as well. So people can link back to that as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that that would be great because again, I mean, we've got we've got people that want to implement, and and that gave that gave our listeners exactly you know where to focus their attention, um, you know, if they want to try to stave off or reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Exactly. Um, okay, so a couple more questions for you, Cyrus. We'll kind of go maybe rapid fire on this one, but in your almost ten years now of of, of doing this. What is the most unusual or surprising thing you've learned about our brain? Wow. Uh, in terms of what I've learned, I think that the connection of physical activity to the brain was the most surprising thing to me because I wasn't necessarily surprised about the obesity relationship. Right. But the fact that we could actually do something to improve our brain that was something I found incredibly powerful. And you know, the paper that I originally published on that, this was way back in 2010, has been cited uh, and replicated by almost 300 other labs worldwide. Wow. So it was a finding that you know, we looked at, but then other people were able to replicate. And so the fact that other people are coming to the same answer as you is incredibly powerful in terms of implementing it into clinical practice because you know it's actually a truly real finding that can be applied on a large scale. And that to me is incredibly, uh, incredibly. But then I started seeing it in individual patients. It's right. one thing to see the data in a big group. It's another thing to see it in an individual patient. So, so when I started seeing that, 
And I started seeing that only in the last couple of years when I started looking at longitudinal imaging and single patients, that was also very powerful because it was like the single patient confirmation. You know, usually you do the other way around. You see it right. in one patient and you replicate it in a big group. Right. Here it was the other way around. We showed it in a big group and replicated it in single patients. That was also incredibly powerful as well. Do you find that it's sometimes more powerful to see it in an individual because it gives it that human element as opposed to a big group of kind of data points? I think that it becomes incredibly powerful when you can say to the patient that they can actually improve their brain and here's the proof of it. Because the big data, it's very granular. It's very kind of uh, scientific. But I think when you're saying it to a patient as a doctor, there's an emotional component to it that's incredibly satisfying yeah. uh, that, that you can get from the data in a very general way, but you don't get to see how it can positively affect the patient's life like you do when you're actually counseling a patient on that sort of right. thing. Right. So you gave us a, a little bit of a hint of what we can expect in the next five to 10 years. Um, what else do you envision in terms of uh, brain health in the next five or 10 years? I predict that brain health will become a trillion dollar a year industry because I think that it's one thing to have the science showing that we can do this, but we need an infrastructure for applying it. Individuals might try to improve their lifestyle, but they need help to do it sometimes. And right. so there has to be an associated industry that helps them do it. A similar example of this in orthopedics is physical therapy. You know, we have physical therapy for many, many different athletes and individuals who want to improve their joint health and their mobility. Right. And, and so it wasn't just the doctor doing the physical. I mean, there's a whole industry that, that sprouted up around that. Right. And so we, we need something similar for brain health for that okay. to really become applied. So if that's physical rehab, what would... A, a mental rehab facility look like? Well, they'd be connected in the sense that you need good physical activity to promote good mental activity. But yeah. I think it also comes down to addressing the mental aspects in terms of some sort of meditative practice with good evidence base. Maybe it's mindfulness, maybe it's TM, maybe it's other things that are developed in the future. Uh, some individuals believe uh, that using apps can be helpful as well. So Adam Ghazali at UCSF is actually developing apps for that purpose. Uh, and so that could very well be something in the future that we see could be very helpful. I don't think we have the evidence for that yet, but I do think people are doing those studies. So we'll know in the next several years how strong that evidence is. Uh, and then I think ultimately it comes down to building up communities. So, you know, when I came to San Francisco and you see all this CrossFit around, the idea that you have communities of individuals who are trying to promote their wellness together, I think is incredibly powerful as well. Uh, it's, the whole, it's the whole idea that you belong to a tribe, right? That right. shares your goals and shares your values. And then you have podcasts like these that are kind of enforcing some of the practices and teachings. And so it's multifaceted across medicine, science, media, and business, but unified with common sets of objectives. And I think ultimately that's how this is all going to work, if it's going to work at all. And I think that's why you need collaborators at all aspects of this ecosystem to make that happen. This has been an amazing podcast, Cyrus. My head is spinning. There's so much information here. Um, I can't thank you enough for, for being here and sharing this with us today. If our listeners want to follow you, where can they go to get more of your research and, and the things that you're putting out for people? Oh, yeah, of course. Well, uh, you know, I think uh, probably what makes the most sense is to follow me at Cyrus Raji on Twitter, uh, where, you know, I can share some links to some of my recent work talks. And I think that that would be uh, something that people can go to to get more information. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, I'm always available to try to field questions. And I think, uh, you know, those are some areas that could be helpful uh, there as well. Okay. And, and just to reiterate, uh, we'll have a lot of these studies that we mentioned in the show notes for you guys. And uh, Cyrus's recent talk um, is on YouTube. We'll put a link to that uh, on the blog post for this as well. And we'll share that on our social media also. Uh, Cyrus, final question. This is the one that every guest has to answer. We want to know your top three tips to live optimal. Know why you're doing what you're doing. If you find that you're going through life 
and you're not sure why you're doing what you're doing, you have to step back and reassess that. Because unless you answer that question, you will not be able to address anything else. Uh, that's the first tip. The second tip is to include people in your life that help your ability to live a healthy life. If you're around people where you think to yourself, they're not really helping me live a better life, then you have to find people who can do that for you in your life. That's extremely helpful. Uh, and I think the third thing that I would uh, say is always find a way to connect back to the positive points of any situation. And gratitude's one way of doing that. But I think if you find yourself focusing on the negative points a lot of the time, you also have to step back and reassess why you're doing that too. So I think the ability to assess and reassess yourself and ask those questions are very important because you may be the only one who could do that for yourself. That's really good advice. Um, something that may be harder, uh, easier said than done. Do you have any like practical ways that people can do that or, or sort of kind of like monitor the, themselves? The most important thing is to slow down. You have to find a way to slow down and give yourself time to think. A lot of people say that they don't have time to do that. But we all know that's not quite true, is it? Well, we all know that those are the people that most need it. Right. But, you know, yeah. we, have, we, we have all sorts of distractions in our society, whether it's, you know, certain games or certain social outlets. And those are all great. But you, if people have time for those things, you definitely have time to step back and slow down. And so just taking a day just to do nothing, just to hang out, just to think you would be amazed at how much inspiration that gives you to answer the questions that I posed earlier. But if you're constantly on a treadmill and you're not doing that, you won't have the perspective to start answering those questions. So slowing down gives you the opportunity to gain perspective. Beautifully said. Um, Cyrus, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. For you guys listening, go to naturalstacks.com. We'll have the uh, link to the blog post for this and all of the research, uh, all the resources that we've brought up today. Uh, go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Let us know how much you like the show uh, and share the OPP with your friends, with the people in your life who uh, you know will benefit from what we're talking about, what we're doing here. And uh, you know anybody in, in your life that you, know, you want to help them protect their brain and their health, share this with them. And, and that's how we help more people and grow this thing, just like Cyrus said. So uh, for you guys listening, thanks for being here. Cyrus, thanks for being here as well. Thank you.